Have you ever wanted to be great at something? It's okay, you can raise your hand. <laughs> have you ever wanted to have true power and influence? Well, today we're going to talk about that. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Jason Carter, and I am the youth slash worship pastor here at Family Life Church. And uh, just an honor to get to share with you this morning. And so uh, today, since it is my chance to share, I'm going to give a couple of shout outs because we like to do that around here. Uh, the first shout out I'd like to give, can I have the tech and the worship team just raise your hands real quick? I mean, let's give these guys a, a hand real, if you don't mind. So I get the pleasure to serve with these folks every single week, and uh, sometimes I make their life a little hard, <laughs> um, but they work hard every week. The, the thing that we always say in ministry is that Sunday always comes, like we don't really get a break. So Monday, I'm sending out a new set of music, new set of lyrics. Sometimes they're having to learn songs on the fly, and then sometimes they get here and uh, I've changed keys or I've changed songs on them altogether, and that makes me a super popular person. <laughs> First thing on a Sunday morning. Matter of fact, a couple weeks ago, we were working on a new song, and it just was not going right. And sometimes you just have to, like, make an executive decision. I said, all right, that's not working. we got to do this other song. We didn't even have a chance to practice it, and we just went and done it. So I just give those guys a lot of uh, <clears throat> honor this morning because they do a lot to make sure Sunday morning goes off without a, without a uh, hitch. And then the tech booth, those, those guys, if you've never been in the tech booth, there's a lot of buttons and lever, levers to, to mash and pull, and, and, and there's a lot of stuff that you can mess up back there. So those guys work really hard as well. They make us sound good, um, and, and so I just appreciate them as well. One thing I know about serving in ministry for about 20-plus years is that tech booths, they don't get a lot of glory. You either get this reaction, hey, it's too soft, I can't hear, right? That's one. The next one is, hey, it's too loud, turn them down, right? You never get this one. This is the third one I'd love to see. Hey, it sounds perfect. Thank you, guys. You're doing such a great job. So they have a really tough job, so I appreciate what they do. And then lastly, uh, Thursday nights, we have student ministries that meet here every Thursday. And so we have a lot of kids that come in. And uh, we have small group leaders, uh, Jacqueline, Leanna, uh, Donna, who's not here at the first service. But without them, Thursday nights would go really terrible and chaotic. So the way we do Thursday nights is we... We have an activity, we, we share a message, and then we break up into small groups, and we let the students share their faith. We talk about what they just heard, how can they apply it to real life. And so it's a really powerful time for them to serve. And uh, so I appreciate them. And, and plus the youth trips, they, they go on all these extracurricular activities that we do. And let me encourage you, if you've never been on a youth trip, sign up for one as a chaperone, right? We have one coming in June. I expect all of you I expect to have 100 chaperones in June. <laughs> that would be super nice, right? Uh, but it will get you closer to Jesus. <laughs> um, and and you, have to learn how, you have to learn all kinds of different skills. You know that math you didn't think you would use back in high school? Uh, like, usually I don't let the kids hold their own money, like, for their food. I usually keep that, and I'm kind of the banker, the Monopoly guy. But there was one trip. I was like, you know what? They need to learn responsibility. They're going to hold their own money for their food. Huge mistake. Um, Jason, I had money for three days, and, and I don't have any more money. Well, we've literally been here for four hours. <laughs> True story. So then you're like, well, how, how, am I, how am I going to feed them? I can't take them back hungry, right? So it will get you closer to Jesus because the whole time you'll be praying, Lord, I don't want to kill one of these kids. <laughs> Lord, Lord, just get me through these three days. I repent of my sins. It will get you there, I promise you. So it's fun and uh, really interesting. So, but it's a pleasure that I get to serve them, and uh, it's just an honor. So uh, I just wanted to give them guys a, a little bit of honor this morning. And in each and every one of us, I believe there's a desire to be great, to do something great. Maybe when you were a kid, you had a dream, like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a policeman. I want to play for the NFL. We all had a dream to do something great. And, and maybe we have a hobby that we're really good at. I know people that will put a lot of money and time and effort into a hobby. Or maybe you wanted to be great at a sport. 
See, I was never great at sports. I'm good at watching sports, but never really great at sports. I played them, just not very well. Or maybe your job. Maybe you love your job, and you think, you know, I want to do great at this job. I want to be the best that I can be at this particular job. And so we all have that desire, and, and our culture is really saturated with greatness. And if you don't believe me, just after lunch, go to Barnes & Noble and ask them where the self-help section is. You have enough information there to last you probably multiple years and then some. Or we here at the church, we like to listen to podcasts. You know, there's a bunch of great uh, men who, who put out these podcasts, and they really do have great information. I'm not, not making light of that. There's plenty of podcasts that will keep you busy, how to reach greatness, how to be effective, how to have influence. Or if you just got YouTube, just put in there how to be great, and you'll get all these motivational videos. And so we're eating up with it. We, we put people on pedestals. You know, it could be a celebrity. It could be a politician. That's a joke. Um, it could be, you know, we, we see people, Facebook, oh, look, who, look what they did. You know, they, they won the Best Actor Award or or, you know, they did this or that. We, we elevate people that we see as great. And some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, you're kind of making uh, ambition sound like a dirty word. Like you're kind of making ambition sound a little taboo. And that's actually the furthest thing from the truth. Matter of fact, when I first started learning how to play drums, I wanted to be the best drummer in my town. That was my goal. When my football life ended in high school, I, I, I learned to play drums my senior year. I said, I'm going to be the best drummer in my town. Now, granted, there's only other two other drummers in the whole town, but I was going to be one of three, okay? I wasn't going to be two of three or three of three. It's like, I'm going to be the best drummer I can be. So ambition is not a bad word. Ambition is not a dirty word. Ambition is what gives you motivation. It drives you to be better. So there's nothing absolutely wrong with that. But today, we're going to talk about how do you become great, but do it God's way. There's a way to be great, but there's a right way to do it. So today I want to teach you how to finish last. How to finish last. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? Doesn't really make sense. That would be saying, um, we're going to award the Cleveland Browns the, the, uh, the championship. Like they've been like 5 and 48 the past three years. That would be saying, you know, we're going to take the worst team in college and we're going to give them the national championship, right, like UCF. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> sorry, Mark. That, that would be like saying, you know what, no one, no one ever talks about the last guy drafted in the NFL draft, right? They actually call him Mr. Irrelevant. Like, imagine having that title for the rest of your life. Well, here we have the best player in all of college football, but today, let's talk about the last guy drafted today, Mr. Irrelevant. Like, imagine putting that on your resume for your next job. <laughs> like, I was just kind of mediocre, but I think I'd really be great at this position. So it's funny. We, we look at greatness, and the world has a way to do that. The world has a way. You've probably had bosses that you probably went home, and you're like, man, what a scumbag. What a jerk. I don't feel like going back to work tomorrow because people in your life have abused authority. But God says there's a different way to be great. There's a different way to raise that elevation in your own life. And if you really want to understand Jesus during his time when he walked the earth, which leads me to my first point, which is in your bulletin and on the board, that oftentimes God will operate in the contrary. God will operate in the opposite. And I'll explain that a little bit better as, as we go along. But if you really want to know Jesus during his day, you have to understand the situation and the circumstance that he was in. It had been 400 years since God had spoken to anyone. That little page that you see between the Old and the New Testament, that actually represents a 400-year period of what they call silence. No prophets, no men of God coming out with a word, no writings. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he is coming into a situation where the religious leaders are ruling the day, but they're doing it in a really warped way. They're living under oppression from Roman rule, and instead of the religious leaders actually being a help to people, they're actually a bit of a, a burden to people. Like they were so concerned about rules and regulations 
and prominence and position that they weren't helping people where God was, his heart is to help people, but they were, they're like, you know what, we're just so worried about what the rule says. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he's very dangerous because he's countercultural to what the situation was at the time. Jesus arrives on the scene and he's different. He's, he's opposite of what they're expecting. And so with the religious leaders, they have their rules, their regulations, and Jesus is doing everything opposite what they think he should be doing. So he's dangerous. John the Baptist is the exact same thing. Matter of fact, John was so dangerous that they took his head. They took his life because he was calling people out on their junk. Sometimes God has to call us out on our junk, right? So every once in a while, we need that wake-up call. But Jesus was dangerous to the system of that day. And it's funny because he was actually teaching a crowd of people. And he and his disciples, they're making their way to Jerusalem. And Jesus stops them and says, look, you've been with me for three years. And I I need to tell you something. That very soon I'm going to be captured. I'm going to be beaten. And I'm going to die. And I just think you should know that, right? It's a pretty important conversation at this time. And now remember, these guys had been with Jesus 24-7 for three straight years. Minus the times where Jesus would get along by himself to pray, he's with these 12 guys. So they had ultimate relationships with one one another. So Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die. And I love the disciples because they're kind of thick skulled like me sometimes. Like they hear stuff and doesn't quite register, and sometimes they have to hear things again and again and again. <clears throat> and so we pick it up in Mark chapter 10. I love it. Jesus had just told them, hey, this is going to happen. I'm going to die. And you have James and John, the sons of Zebedee, brothers. So it says in verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Let's pause there. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to die. Lord, that's really heavy. But while we're talking, can you do us a favor? And I can imagine Jesus just stopping. Maybe he smirked. I believe he might have smirked. And he says, okay, I'll play along with this. So we find it in verse 36. He says, okay, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. And then they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left when you come into glory. In other words, when when we're in heaven, and you're on your throne, can one of us have the right and the other the left? Now, the the passage actually talks about how the other ten disciples actually started to bicker and gripe, and we're kind of like, what? I can actually even imagine Peter, who's usually the one that's sticking his foot in his mouth, over there like, really? Really? Lord, see, I'm really not that bad. (laughs) But can you imagine? Jesus has spent three years ministering with these guys. And and they come up and they ask this question. But I actually don't blame them because remember the time that they were growing up in? It was all about position. It was all about power. It was about prominence. And so they're just a product of their environment. They're a product of where they grew up. But they're, Jesus, you know, we're, we're really cool, and, you know, we've been really faithful. Can you give us a promotion, right? That's the ultimate promotion. In, in glory, one on the right, one on the left. But then Jesus drops what we call a counterintuitive bomb, a countercultural bomb on them. And he says this in verse 42 where we pick back up. <clears throat> he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and they're... Thank you. And their high officials exercise authority over them. So Jesus is telling them, look, you guys know where you grew up. You know how the religious leaders are. You know how your leaders are. They take their authority and they abuse it. He says this in the next verse. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first 
must be a slave to all. Powerful. But Jesus, that's not how we do things around here. We get elected and we wear robes and we have people follow us because we're great. And Jesus said, no, that's not the way it's going to be in my kingdom. We're going to do things opposite. If you ever looked at Superman comics, you know that he had bizarro world where everything was opposite. Jesus is saying, this is how we're going to do things. You want position? You want true power? You want real influence? You're going to have to submit yourself. If you want to be an apostle, you got to be a disciple first. If you want true change, you got to learn to serve. you got to learn to love. It's not about who's in charge. It's not about who's in control. It's about who loves the most. And once again, they're thick. They're thick. They don't, they don't quite get it. But then we find them picking up in John 13. Jesus has one last lesson, which is our second point. That true leadership is not based on position, but based on heart. True position, true leadership is not based on position, but heart. We find this story. Now remember, Jesus has told him that he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. This story picks up in John's account. It's Passover. They're, they're all eating, you know, the Last Supper, the nice painting. The disciples are sitting around. And so it's the last night that Jesus is going to be with his disciples. And imagine if it's your last night on earth and you're with your friends and family, what would your message be to those people? What would you say to them if you knew that in just a matter of hours, life was going to change forever? And I'm sure the disciples still did not understand this. And Jesus is looking around the table, and he just sees hearts and egos and things that are still not matching up with the kingdom And I can almost imagine Jesus saying, Lord, these are the 12 guys you want me to leave behind? These are the 12 that are going to go change the world? Matter of fact, if you read Luke's account, Luke talks about that while they're sitting around the table, they actually began to argue amongst themselves about who was going to be great. The same topic that Jesus just addressed earlier. But they're still sitting around, who's going to be in first place? And who's going to do this? And who's going to do what? And Jesus is like... Jesus normally would speak in parables, and if you're not sure what a parable is, it's a a story type that they would use in the Jewish times. Jewish leaders and and, uh, rabbis would use it. It's a story with a deeper meaning in it, basically. And so Jesus said, well, instead of teaching them another parable, I'm going to act out what I want them to do. So we find this in John 13, starting with verse 4. He says, so he got it from the mill took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And so he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Let's stop there for a second. How many of you have ever been to a foot washing? Right? So uh, I grew up in the Assembly of God. Very traditional. We, we would do foot washings every great once in a while. And, and I'm sure there's still churches that do it, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's, it's a very powerful experience if you ever get the opportunity. I, I actually encourage it. But foot washing in this day was a custom. And so let's imagine this. Let's imagine you've got a pair of loafers on, and you're walking around the Florida heat, and you don't have any socks on. And at the end of the day, you take those shoes off, and it's like, Well, take that experience and, like, multiply it by 100. All right, these gentlemen, they were walking around. There's no paved streets, a lot of dirt, a lot of dust, a lot of animals walking around doing things that animals should not be doing on roads. And so when you would come into a house, the normal custom was that the, the owner of the house, the master of the house, would have a servant there waiting for you. And if it was, if they had multiple servants, usually it was the job of the one, like the low man on the totem pole, like the the guy who just came in. And so it was normally their job to offer you 
hey, would you like us to wash your feet? Nowadays, thank goodness we just ask for their coat or their hat. <laughs> would you like a bottle of water? But back then, it's, would you like us to wash your feet? And so these gentlemen, their feet were crusty, nasty, dirty. And when Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet, Peter's like, whoa, Lord, that's, that's just way too much. You, you can't wash my feet, Lord. A servant should be doing this. So he says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replies, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, I, you have no part of me. Now, Peter normally, like I said earlier, he's normally the one sticking his foot in his mouth. But there was a lot of times in the Gospels where he actually got it right. And he says this, Then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. So in other words, Lord, if that's what it takes, I want all of you. But Jesus humbles himself. And he's doing the work of a servant. He's doing the work that someone else should be doing, not the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I can finally imagine that the point finally started to make its way into their skull, into their psyche, and into their heart. That Jesus committing this act that a servant normally would do finally started to make sense. And I can imagine that the three, that they started to think back about the past three years that they've spent with Jesus. Remember, Jesus did things that he shouldn't have done. He healed on the Sabbath. That got him in trouble so many times. He loved the unlovable. He forgave people who had committed adultery that there was a group of people waiting to stone this woman. And he goes up and he says, he was without sin. Let him cast the first stone. And they all leave. And he says, well, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. And so he forgives her of her sin. And Jesus is doing things over and over and over again that are making people crazy because it's against the rules, but not against God's rules, not against God's heart. And so Jesus has been trying to show them for the past three years, my heart, the Father's heart, is to love one another. Matter of fact, when he's teaching, they ask him, a bunch of religious leaders come up and say, Jesus, what's the greatest rule? They're trying to catch him in something so they can stone him or kill him. And he says, the greatest commandment is to love your Lord, your God, with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. And they're like, okay, we can, we can live with that. And then he says, and the second is like it. Wait, Jesus, there can't be two number ones. He says, the second was, is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so Jesus has just committed an act that a servant would do. But the three years, if you go back and you look, every time that Jesus would heal, multiple times it would say he was moved with compassion. And then he would do this. Then he would heal. And so he's trying to get this through the, the disciples' heads. And if you think back, we talk about this every Christmas. Where was Jesus born? Okay, but where, in a manger. Jesus was born in a manger. And you cannot ever convince me like I said, I'm, I'm real stubborn. I'm real hard-headed. You can never convince me that that was not strategic. Jesus was born in a manger. Why? Because where, where's mangers? Servants are working in mangers. It's dirty. It smells. Jesus was not born in the lap of luxury. He's not born in a palace surrounded by servants. He's not born where it's really posh and clean. And perfect. He's born in a place where servants spend their time, where servants spend their sweat, their blood, their tears, their hours keeping it clean. And I believe that God said, This is a strategic place because you're not coming in like the religious leaders of your day. Because you are counterculture, you're going to do things different. And your people need to understand that. The, the people of that day, they were expecting a king to come in and set them free. When Jesus comes on the scene, he doesn't come in as a political figure. You know, the, the people of Israel, what do they always want? They want a king. Back in Samuel, you can read where, God, we need a king because we need to be like other nations. 
And so when Jesus comes in, they're expecting like Rambo to come in like guns blaring and blasting. And he's going to set us free. But instead of coming in, he says things like, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other. But Jesus, we like violence. Jesus, we like war. We're under Roman oppression and, and we need freedom. But Jesus is telling them things like, nope, if someone hits you, turn them the other one. I can imagine Peter saying, Jesus, if someone hits me, I'm going to drop that fool. He's going down like a ton of bricks, brother. But Jesus is not that way. Jesus is opposite everything that they thought. Jesus said, no, if you really want to make a difference, learn to ser serve one another. Learn to love one another. That's the true heart of God. That's the true heart of God this morning. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it's interesting that when Jesus, he, he just coming out of the wilderness, he's been tempted. It's been 40 days since he's had any food, uh, any water. He's, he's been fasting. And when he comes out and he begins his actual public ministry, he sees John baptizing. Now, most guys, because I can say that I'm a guy and I know egos, most guys would have come out of the wilderness and said, John, we really appreciate what you've been doing for us. And, you know, your baptizing ministry, that's really excellent. But, you know, I'm going to go ahead and take over now. We appreciate you. We wish you luck in all your future endeavors. But what does Jesus do? He comes in and says, John, I want you to baptize me. And I'm sure John was even expecting Jesus just to come on, take over, and he just go on along his way. But Jesus says, no, John. I need you to baptize me. John, I'm trying to prove a point to these people. <laughs> that the heart of God is not ruling over people. That the heart of God is not position and prominence. The heart of God is, I love them. I care for them. And if we really want to make a difference, church, we've got to learn to serve one another. Got to learn to love one another. Got to learn to serve those on the outside of these walls as well. I, uh, I find it actually pretty interesting that even with Jesus, and this will be the last point I make about the, bat, uh, the uh, foot washing, who was still at the table when Jesus was washing feet? Judas. If that's not the most powerful thought process or most powerful example of servanthood, I'm not sure what is. Jesus knew that that man was betraying him. Jesus knew that because of Judas, in a matter of hours, his life would change forever. That his disciples' lives would change forever. But he still washes Judas' feet. He still takes that opportunity to show what a true servant is. What a true, uh, excellent servant is. Servant leadership. And it's funny that CEOs and companies are now talking about servant leadership. Actually, the past 40 years in America, a lot of these corporations like AT&T and some of these other businesses, they're talking about servant leadership. They're putting their CEOs through servant leadership. And it's like Jesus has been talking about this for over 2,000 years. But America is finally starting to kind of, you know what, it might be about other people. It might be about someone else other than myself. So, where can we serve? I would first like to say this point number three is that when you serve, lives are changed, but the first life change is your own. That when you serve, you can change lives, you can influence lives. That influence and that power I was talking about earlier, that could be yours. But I guarantee you that your, the first life change will be your own. And this morning, if you sit here and you say, well, I don't know if I really believe in God and I'm not sure if I believe in Jesus, that's okay. Servanthood is a universal theme. You have a group, a body of believers here that, you know what, you can join in. You can help out. Because serving is universal. We all need love. We all need compassion. We all need help. So where can we serve? The first place I believe it starts is at home. If you want to learn how to serve, learn to serve at your own house. 
Why do I say that? Because your house is usually where we're the most relaxed, the most comfortable, where we're more like our real self than we are on the outside world. So learn to serve at home. That means husbands, when you get home, it's okay to turn on March Madness. But if there's dishes in the sink, there's laundry that can be done, it's okay to go ahead and do that too. No one's going to think you're girly. No one's going to think you're less of a man. Wives, I'm not going to say anything about wives because I I don't want to get in trouble. But (laughs) teenagers, teenagers, I know you're out there listening in the lobby. I know you can hear me. Don't pretend. Find something to do without being asked to do it. Find something to do without expecting anything in return. Just because you love your parents and you love Jesus. Secondly, obvious, it's the obvious one, we can serve in church. We have so much that's going on every week. We can always use help. Uh, maybe, though, it's something like you can pray for people. Maybe they're sick people, and you can pray for them. Maybe you can take them soup. Maybe you're a really great soup cooker. Is that a word? I don't know, I'm not sure. But you can help people. Maybe you can give someone a ride to church. That's serving. Maybe you have the best smile in the world. We really need great, excellent door greeters who welcome people in that may have never been here before. That's serving. Obviously, there's the, the obvious ones you can serve on the worship team. They're tech. If you love kids, maybe you're really great with kids. After you pass a background check, you can help out with kids. There's always something that you can do here. Uh, and I'm going to say this. Um, even, even if you're out there and you see, like, a garbage can that's, like, maybe overflowing, it's okay to take the garbage out, too. Uh, you don't have to be in planning center for that. And I can promise you that no one's going to tell you, hey, put that garbage down. What are you doing with that? That's sacred garbage. You're not scheduled to take garbage out. <laughs> I can promise you they'll give you a smile, a pat on the back, and they'll help you fill it with an empty bag. Lastly, where can we serve? Your community. Because they need you. Once you learn to serve at home, you serve one another here in church, love and compassion, we got to take it outside of these walls. I love the hashtag for Ocala. It's great. It's catchy. But it has to be more than a hashtag. It has to be more than just something on social media. It has to be burned in our hearts. Because that's the only way we're going to see real change and be really effective for the kingdom of God. Maybe you have a ministry that you've never considered doing but because you're maybe afraid of that. Hey, come to us. Maybe you want to serve and you're not sure where to get started. Connect point tonight, 5 o'clock. We'll get you started. We'll, we'll put you in somewhere. And if that position doesn't quite work for you, we'll help you. We're not just going to leave you on the wayside. We'll help you. We'll guide you to the right place. Because we want God to, to, to build his faith in you. We want you to grow and, and, and just change lives forever. It's not about talent. It's not about position. It's about good attitude and a willingness to serve and a good heart. Let me share this picture with you as I start to close. This gentleman, you all recognize him, right? No, I didn't think so. You wouldn't recognize him. He's not a celebrity. He's not famous by any means. Um, You would never know his name unless I brought him up today. But this guy right here, this is uh, this is actually my hero. Uh, Try to keep it together here. His name is Brother Dees, and uh, he was the custodian at my home church for like forty, almost fifty years. Matter of fact, if you go to his his tombstone, it actually reads Brother (laughs) Dees. It's kind of funny, the church paid for his funeral, but he never preached a sermon. He never sang from the platform. He didn't write any great books that changed the world. All he did was he served. We would be in youth lock-ins, and I would see Brother D's like at 2, 3 in the morning, cleaning bathrooms, vacuuming out Sunday school rooms. That's why he's my hero, because you don't know him but the, the impact that he made on my little town, matter of fact, the, the family sent me this picture. 
And when I asked for it on Facebook initially, I had so many private messages about him. And he passed away back in 2006. But the impact he still makes to this day, just because he was a servant, just because he loved and he didn't expect anything in return, he didn't get paid all those years, he did it voluntarily. That, to me, is excellence. That, to me, is greatness. That, to me, is what Jesus, his mission, his ministry, his words are all about. Let me close with this scripture. So how do you finish last? You put your heart first, your ego aside. This comes from Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, do not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus paid a great price because he loved the world. We should do likewise by loving and serving one another and then serving those that are in our community. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word, your love. God, I pray that we would have servants' hearts. That God, if, if we're struggling with position, if we're struggling with the desire for prominence, God, we pray that you would help us to lay those things aside, God. That we can make a real difference in the world change the world. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve. And this morning, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I'd like to give you that opportunity this morning. If God's been tugging at your heart and you know that he's doing a work in your life, this morning I'd like to pray with you. So if you would just pray, Jesus, we thank you. We pray that you would just forgive us of our sins. God, that you would wash us clean. Lord, that we would be more like you. We thank you in Jesus' name.